Uh, you today? Not today. The you will, you might need them on Wednesday or Friday. I haven't decided yet, but. Um, okay, well, uh, welcome back. Happy Monday. Um, hopefully everybody is staying warm. Although I really like the, the frost on all the trees. It's really pretty driving here. Um, okay, uh, what we talked about last time, which was last week, Wednesday, oh my goodness gracious. What are you doing to me? Huh. We'll see how well this works. It starts reviving. Uh, so what we talked about last week, um, what did we talk about last week? Processors. We did talk about processors. That was your design problem. Give me time for like five. Watch your head. I hit the trash can. Nice dock, by the way. I don't think I would have hit you, but it's always good to be prepared. Much better. Okay, so we did talk about processors. Uh, that was the design problem. What else did we talk about last week? Okay, um, and that's that's a lot of, of what uh, we focused on just because I, I do see this as a design class. Um, one of the, the goals that I would have of all of you leaving this class uh, is not that you can sit down and be like, that's a resistor. Um, that's, that's a little elementary for, for all of you at this point. Um, but I want you to actually be able to design a circuit that can do something you want it to do, okay? Um, and that's, that's where I want to build towards in this course. Now, I think a lot of you already should be able to, to build a circuit. Um, your first design assignment was to create a, uh, a power circuit for an LED. Now, the, the things that you have to consider when it comes to an LED design are, this is really straightforward. First of all, you have... Uh, what? So 1.5 volts. Uh, you'd probably put four of them. Um, in series to make this be a, a six volt power supply, something like that. Uh, now six volts doesn't always mesh well of <laughs> with a five volt resist, uh, five volt uh, uh, LED. So if you just did this, um, you're gonna burn your LED out. First of all, there is no um, there is no current control, uh, and second of all, there's no. I mean, you're you're pumping six volts into a, a five volt system. Um, the way that LEDs work are LEDs have a set amount of voltage that they consume uh, and they will only consume that amount of voltage and as they are consuming that voltage the rest of the voltage is gets pushed off to the rest of the system so what you end up with is you have a wire that ends up having to consume one volt of power well one volt of, of energy um, and that wire is continuously trying to push that energy back into the diode, uh, which causes the diode to heat up. So the better way of building this type of system uh, is just to put a resistor in here. And I had a lot of questions about, well, what size of resistor do you put in here? Well, 
as a designer, that's, that's kind of up to you. If you put in a, uh, a 10 kilo ohm resistor, yeah. So it doesn't matter where you place the resistor, doesn't it have to go in front of the um, LED? It could go behind it. It could go here, go here, you can put the switch here. You can actually switch all three of these components because they're all in series. So why, why wouldn't the, the, the power like immediately, um, the volts, the six volts immediately burn out the LED if it comes first? Because here, you're only gonna have a five volt drop between here and here. When the, when the battery submits power, it, it's basically like sending seekers out that look through the entire loop to determine what all components is it gonna have to run through to get back to here, okay? Uh, the electrons aren't just running out here and then they f you know, encounter the first thing they find and then voltage drop. No, it's, it has to have a, a closed loop and it has to know what the, the loop behavior is gonna be before an electron even leaves. Um, so you can mix all three of these components up because they're in series. Uh, but if you were to put a 10 kilo ohm resistor there, what's going to happen is um, this is going to drastically reduce the current. Here, you're going to have one volt dropped over 10, 10 kilo ohms, uh, which means that your current through this component is going to be uh, trying to figure out the, the magnitude on that one. One divided by 10,000. It would be 0.0001 amp, okay? So if you do it that way, you'll have 0.0001 amp flowing through your circuit, which, which what that means is that the total amount of power that's going through your circuit is, is gonna be six times 0.001, so you have 0 0.0006 watts of power being used. So that's pretty awesome. But that also means that you're producing 0 0.0005 because P equals VI and P equals here, this is five times 0 0.0001, which means that P is equal to 0 0.0005 watts, okay? So here, this component, you've, you've got a, a five ten thousandths or a one, two, one, one, uh, one divided by two thousandths of a watt of power coming out of your LED, uh, which is really, really small. Uh, a lot of LEDs uh, at their brightest setting uh, will want something like 0.1 milliamps uh, of current going through it. If it's just a single LED, um, you want it a little bit dimmer than that. Uh, I think you can go down to like 0.001 uh, but even then, that's that's pretty pretty low. No, sorry, 0 0.01, not so. Uh, LED range usually wants somewhere between uh, 0, 0.0, probably five. Uh, you could probably put up to 0.5 amps of current through an LED. Um, but even then, I would be very concerned. Um, but putting this resistor in here, this is necessary for power control, okay? Uh, in any system, you're going to have to include elements of power control into it. And why is that? Well, because you can't just leave them to regulate themselves, okay? Uh, if you look at your Raspberry Pi, there are resistors all over the thing. Um, you look at your phone, if you were to break your phone open, there's resistors everywhere. Uh, and it's not because resistors make it more efficient. Uh, resistors are literally heat dissipating devices. Um, the idea is that it, it reduces the current, which I, I guess it does make it more efficient, but it, it makes it more efficient by reducing the current. It's a power control mechanism, okay? Um, if you were to try to take this system here and rebuild it, like this. Uh, 
on let's say this is a 100 ohm resistor. Okay. Is this a better configuration for power than the last one? Why not? Well, you have this closed loop that you can create, okay? Every closed loop basically acts independently of each other. So here you have this closed loop and you have this closed loop. Uh, here you're plugging six volts over a five volt situation. Again, this is once again, we're running into that same problem. So this doesn't really help. If you put a resistor down here, well then you can, you can regulate that, the amount of current that's going through that uh, diode now. But you're still drawing power that's going through here unnecessarily. Okay? Yeah. Sorry for asking a question, but- That's fine. Um, so let's just say you have like 10 resistors in there right now. Would, would you still be able to light up the LED, you know, there are like 10 resistors in there? Like 10 resistors in parallel? Uh, 10 resistors like in series, like would you still be able to light it up? Well, it all matters about the uh, equivalent resistance. Okay. If the equivalent resistance of that resistor is, would probably be less than maybe, I don't know, maybe a thousand ohms or something in this configuration, yeah, you'd probably be able to light it up still. But if it's more than a thousand ohms, uh, the LED is going to be really dim. If it's more than ten thousand ohms altogether, then uh, you probably won't be able to see it. But it would still like technically be lighting it up. It would be. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It all matters about equivalent resistance. So here, if we have a circuit where it's it's like this. This circuit, say this is uh, 200 ohms. All of them are. This is the same as this circuit. Has the same behavior, same power consumption of the power supply, same amount of current through that resistor, uh, but what, what would be the equivalent resistance on that? Anybody remember your parallel series relationships? Is, this is 800. That's work, Kenny. Okay. Um, now you know all these are in series because the input and the of uh, the input to this component is the output of this component. And the output of this component is the input to this component. So it's all, it's all in series. If we were to draw the trajectory uh, of an electron as it traveled through the loop, it would go through all of the components sequentially. It wouldn't be able to change which component. It doesn't have any selection. It has to go through all of them because they're all in series. Okay. So do I need to go back and cover equivalent resistances? Okay, just trying to gauge the room here. Um, so in this element, it is important to understand how much power uh, is being distributed to every single element, okay? If you reduce the amount of power to an acceptable level, that's best design practice. First of all, less power going through a component means you have uh, less potential for blowing out a circuit, which I did this morning. By the way, we need to buy a, a new five volt converter. Sorry, Nick. Yeah. You it on the motor, you? No. What did you do? We were just playing with the rest of the circuit and it lit on fire. Uh, on fire? Yes. Yeah. We're just, we're just sitting there. I'm like, what's burning? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thankfully. Um, oh, where, where was I? Got distracted by fire. Um, right, so it is, it is really important to understand where your power is being consumed, how it's being transferred through your system, and, and what each component can really take. The less power each component has, 
the less potential for failure that component has. Okay, uh, the more power is given to any single component, uh, the more likely it will not just fail, but fail spectacularly. Now, too little power to any component uh, is going to mean that, that that component doesn't operate correctly. Um, so there is kind of a, a sweet spot where you're aiming for a nominal power supply. Uh, usually, if you have an IC, an integrated chip somewhere, uh, it'll tell you, uh, I want uh, one micro uh, amp into this port. And it usually should tell you something like that. Uh, and in which case, then you'll have a very large resistance uh, that's connected between this and whatever is it's connected to. Um, ICs don't require a lot of power. They do require, well, usually, they don't require a lot of power out of their, their inputs and outputs. They usually require uh, significant voltage, okay? Um, now, in this system, if I were to, let's say I have uh, two processors that are connected to each other, where information from this processor is sent through a wire with, with a resistor uh, to this processor over here, okay? If, if I'm sending that, am I gonna wanna put a capacitor in here? Ryan? Dang it, we're starting this off bad. I'm just gonna start calling you, hey you. All right, Josh, why are you saying no? Right. What this is what this is sending out. If we were to look at uh, because this is a digital information chip, what this is sending out is a series of voltages that change values very swiftly. Okay. If we throw that through a capacitor, what's going to happen is uh, the capacitor is going to store charges when the voltage is high and release charges when the voltage is low, and the end resulting net voltage that's going to be submitted here is gonna look like this. Which isn't good, because that doesn't mean anything. It, we've just converted a, a digital circuit into an analog circuit. Which, I mean, if this is an analog input, then that's fine, but uh, the problem is it's usually not. Um, why can we get away with just putting a resistor in there? A resistor does power control. Why doesn't it have the same behavior as a, a capacitor? Well, they're fundamentally different components. In a resistance circuit, if we have a circuit of resistors like this set up around a power supply, okay, and we uh, connect this, hook it up, run power through this system, uh, the idea is that the, the instant electrons begin transferring through this resistor, we are then pushing electrons from this wire right here through this resistor. That happens simultaneously. It's like if you could imagine the entire circuit is full of marbles. The moment you push a marble through this one, you have to simultaneously be pushing a marble through this one. The whole system begins to move, okay? In this one, none of the marbles stop. As soon as we turn this into a capacitor, some of the marbles stop because we're storing marbles in this ball pit effectively, okay? And if we have some of them stop, it means you may have electrons that are moving here and you'll have electrons that are moving here, but because you're storing some here, when this power supply is removed and you just jump that end, you're still going to have a flow because there is energy that's stored here. 
until all of the marbles are out of this ball pit, um, it's, it's just going to continue to accumulate them, okay? In a resistance-only circuit, where there's only resistors, there's no storage, which means when this is removed, everything stops, okay? And that's the beauty of having resistors. That's why you'll see a lot of resistors on these, even though resistors are heat dissipating elements. They're useful because they limit current. Uh, they, if you had any static electricity uh, or, or any buildup of charges anywhere in your system, um, what's going to happen is when you flip this to zero, uh, those, extra, those excess charges go into the resistor and get dissipated out as heat. Um, because if you don't have any energy that's driving excess charges uh, through your system, resistors stop them. Um, there is an issue if you just directly connect these two with no resistor, uh, you get something called floating voltages. Floating voltages is an issue. Uh, it's, it's kind of a phantom issue. It is, whenever you power components, sometimes you have electrons that go rogue and they hang out in the system that, where they shouldn't. And you don't know how many electrons are in that system that are just going rogue, uh, that are connected to, uh, uh, you know, maybe they're, they're stuck on the inside of a, an insulator or, or they're just uh, in this, stuck in an eddy current inside of a wire or something. Uh, but the moment that the power, well, that the uh, voltage uh, is dropped on this side, there is now nothing driving the motion of those electrons. And so they're just stuck there in the circuit now. Um, and it will create a non-zero voltage reading between the two. And we don't know what they are. Uh, floating voltages is mitigated by putting a resistor in here. Um, so again, resistors are just, you're gonna have them everywhere uh, in a digital circuit. Uh, for the reasons of you don't want floating voltages uh, and you want to, to be able to uh, control the power. So um, just general design principles there. Uh, looking at what the input re here requires will dictate, okay, if you have five volts and you know that this input requires 100 milliamps of current, uh, how big is this resistor going to be? So this is a five volt system. And this one has a nominal reading of 100 milliamps. What does this resistor size need to be? This is five volts, and so this is a five volt circuit. So when this goes up to five volts, this is, will be reading five volts. This nominal behavior occurs when it's passing 100 milliamps of current through it. You were at the first time, it's 50, okay? And the way that you know that is, is because Ohm's law, uh, V equals IR, here V is five, I is 0 0.1, and we're solving for R. Uh, so if you divide 5 by 0 0.1, then R is equal to 50. Okay, so you were, you were right the first time. Um, now, there's not going to be a lot of circuits that require a nominal 100 milliamps of current, but who knows? Um, Okay, um, all right, uh, okay, let's talk about other basic design principles. So, 
Uh, power management is going to be something that in any system you're going to have to have. You're going to have to look at what kind of resistors are needed, and it's, again, it's based on the components. Um, power management is always a necessity. Well, what happens when... Um, what other kinds of, of, I guess, design conditions would you have? Uh, let's say you're doing... This is a very... Uh, a very specific branch of electrical engineering. Um, let's say you're designing circuits for an airplane, okay, or a rocket ship. Uh, in, in most low-grade electrical components, uh, if we do have a static charge buildup where you, know, you touch it, you get shocked, uh, that's not a huge problem because we're all connected to ground. Those electrons eventually go to ground, okay? Uh, you're touching a table. Sometimes they'll jump off of the, the components right onto the table. Um, the issue with aeronautical applications is they have to be designed specifically to be anti-static. All of your electrons have to be contained. It's like a fluid in a, in a rocket ship out in space. Okay? If you have a water bottle and most of the water that comes out of your water bottle ends up in your mouth, <laughs> you've got a problem. Uh, you, you can have these little bubbles of water floating around. If that touches a component, uh, it, it can absolutely destroy millions of dollars worth of componentry. Uh, you don't want water just floating around in space inside of your space capsule. Uh, this is similar to what you have with electrons. You don't just want electrons floating around in, in an aircraft. Um, it's, it's very dangerous uh, because if you have too much static buildup, it can pass through a digital component very easily and fry it. Um, so these have to be anti-static components uh, because there's no way of really grounding them. You can't ground something that's not touching the ground. Um, so a lot of aeronautical applications, they have to be specifically tested so that they are anti-static. Uh, they have to be packaged such that if they were to generate any static electricity, that would be contained within the unit and not spread throughout the aircraft. Uh, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of measures have to be taken here. Um, it's also really important in aeronautical applications that you have a backup system. Because components do fail. And yes, okay, there's a low likelihood that your components are going to fail just randomly at any time, um, particularly not when, when you're using higher grade componentry. Um, some of the stuff we work with is very, very cheap. <laughs> that stuff fails, it doesn't surprise me. Uh, but it doesn't fail after like five minutes of use. Uh, there, is, there is a reliability out of these components that's needed. If a component suddenly fails um, and it's related to the power management system, the power management system has to be able to shut down whatever component isn't working uh, so that it doesn't just become a, a highway for power to, to, which would cause a fire. Uh, so it has to shut it down but then it also has to have uh, power reserves so that if, if that one system is absolutely necessary for flying the airplane, uh, there's a secondary mechanism by which to do it. Okay, and then they'll go in and be like, oh, this is broken. Um, so yeah, this is uh, aeronautical applications, space and, and aircraft, uh, they do require different electrical engineering, a lot more intense. And if you were to go work in, in the aeronautical industry, uh, this is something that, that they've had to learn. They have very, very specialized equipment that they can use uh, to detect any amount of static buildup. Um, it's kind of cool. Uh, that is one of the more regulated areas. Um, there's a lot of
Uh, there are a lot of, of different types of applications, like biomedical applications. If you're creating an electric device uh, for biomedical applications, uh, you have to take into account a number of a number of brand new principles. Um, one of them being material exposure. Uh, you don't want lead getting into somebody's body and a lot of times solder is made with lead, uh, which means even, even the way you solder your components together uh, would have to be very carefully regulated to ensure that you're not poisoning somebody uh, with a pacemaker or, or, with, uh, uh, or with an EEG or, or, or uh, something else that's touching the skin uh, of that person. Uh, uh, electrical components Again, you want to make sure that you have uh, a lot of fuses um, and, and power management. Because you would rather have the component just simply stop working than to start on fire or to electrocute the person. Okay, looking at how you want something to fail, you want it to just simply stop rather than blow up. Um, now with power management, it's important that you use uh, certain types of batteries that are a little bit more inert uh, anytime you use a battery application. Uh, because if you remember back a few years ago, um, there was when uh, the hoverboards were really popular, uh, they blew up on airplanes, started on fires. Uh, that was because the batteries just were not, they weren't managed well, they didn't have power management systems. Uh, set up very well for them, but the batteries themselves also were really low grade. Um, you don't want that happening in any biomedical device. Uh, if you have a if you have a pacemaker that suddenly starts on fire, um, you're getting your butt sued pretty hard. Uh, and aside from, I would say these are probably the two most highly regulated electrical engineering circuitry. Um, aside from that, there's, there's going to be a lot of standards in place. Uh, I know in other classes you've talked about standards, uh, but when it comes to design, uh, there's a lot of components that you can't sell that aren't already regulated. Power supplies have to meet very specific standards such that uh, if you go look at a power supply, uh, usually there is, it requires an inspection. Uh, this has a fuse. Oh, see the inspection. Now, usually they say on a lot of newer power supplies, they'll say this conforms to AI something something standard 2359 uh, for power generating devices. And what that means is that it's not going to light on fire. Uh, it's not going to uh, produce too much power. Um, but, but the standards exist, uh, they do make design pretty uniform. That means when you order a component that says it's 5 volts, it's actually 5 volts and not like, it says it's 5, but it's actually 3. Okay, it gives a little bit more uniformity to what the definition is. Um, but it also increases safety. Uh, and usually increases the cost. Regulations always make things more expensive. Um, but you want to use standardized equipment. Um, just buying an electrical device off of a guy in a, in a back alleyway, um, you cannot guarantee its performance. Okay. All right, so this is kind of all tertiary stuff. Uh, that's related to design. Uh, a lot of this goes into, you have to know what you're designing for, what market you're designing for. Uh, if you don't know what market you're designing for, you're not gonna be able to know what standards. Uh, the standards for both of these are really rigorous and they go beyond just regular electronic st uh, standards. Um, that does require 
a lot more uh, a lot more work on the front end doing research to understand what those standards are, what kind of tests you're going to have to run, uh, what kind of performance you're going to need out of your device in order for it to be uh, satisfactory. Okay, um, that's it for, for other design principles. Um, you should have a reading assignment due tonight that is on... Um, well other design principles. I didn't make you read the whole chapter. The rest of the chapter is good if you want to play with it, but um, I'm, I'm not going to make you read the rest of the chapter for this class. I think I covered everything else that is important. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about um, just how to approach beginning the design of a digital circuit, uh, what the process is, uh, you'll have a reading assignment on that. Uh, what we're going to plan for on Wednesday and Friday is I will give you a design problem, maybe on Wednesday, maybe sooner. Um, count for it on Wednesday. I will at least give it to you by Wednesday. Uh, and uh, we will be working on that uh, in here. It will require some hands-on stuff. Uh, you're going to have to be able to build circuits. Um, just, I think all of you know that, that that's something that I require out of my classes. Uh, if you have a Raspberry Pi, um, we're not going to be using them this week. We'll use them next week. Uh, and we're going to also try to build some other circuits. Uh, but if you have a Raspberry Pi, make sure to try to bring it next week, Wednesday, Friday. Uh, this week we will get away with not having them. Um, all right, any questions, class? It's the only lecture for the week. So you won't need your notebooks, I don't think, next time. Uh, I don't think you're gonna need your computers either because we're gonna focus on actually building stuff. This week, uh, your grade is hand build something. If any of you go into quarantine, and you need accommodations and we're building something physically, let me know, okay? Because I will always make accommodations, uh, but you're gonna have to tell me. We'll try to do as much as we can in person because I think that's just better experience. Okay.